Welcome one and all to another edition of the Default Show. It'll be here on the Five Reasons Sports Network. It was a football-filled weekend. Yes, both the Canes and Dolphins got wins. Both struggled at times. One looked good in the end, the other did not. We will talk about both today with one and only John Conjemi. Thank you to Water Cleanup of Florida. It is that season right now where we don't see the rains as much. It's not rainy season, but water does come. It is Florida. If you do notice signs of leaks on your home, don't let it become a bigger deal than it has to be. Call Water Cleanup of Florida, 954-579-0356. With over 60 years of combined experience between Michael Robert and their entire team, like they have licensed contractors, certified contractors, insured contractors in their employee. The fact that they're on their staff, it is a one-stop shop. Not only they'll find the leak, not only they'll dry it, not only they'll fix it, but they'll make it look brand new and they'll do it all. You can reach out to them 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, 954-579-0356. Or check them out on their website at wcufl.com. You can also check them out on the socials, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, at Water Cleanup FL. Also, if you don't take my word for it, which you should, I worked with them directly. They did great work on my wife and my home. They'll do it for yours. Go to Google with over 75 star reviews. Google will back up everything I have to say. Water Clean by Florida. If you have the schmutz, they have the guts. And Miami Dolphins had lots of guts this weekend as they got down by two touchdowns twice to the Detroit Lions. The offense was spectacular. The defense woke up in the second half. Tua was great. Waddle, Hill, great. We talked about that. And the struggling Hurricanes. Yeah, they got a win versus Virginia, but they did not look good. Did not get a touchdown. Went to four overtimes and it went to to win conversions. Did win at versus a Virginia team that's downtrodden, but it was pretty rough. We talked about that today on Big Skin Playbook with John Congemi. The Defoe Show uh, with Mike Luby Lubitz. I'm Jeff DeForest. Uh, that man is Luby on the other side of your screen. And joining us on the phone lines today, uh, John Congemi with his Big Skin Playbook, also known as Dateline Dolphins. Uh, all right, John, uh, I know you were focused in on this uh, Dolphin game, as you are every week, uh, as part of the uh, Dolphins uh, analytical team there on CBS Sports and uh, various other platforms. Uh, they're trailing Detroit 14 to nothing. Uh, you'll find it surprising. I was at a paramutual facility uh, <laughs> indulging a, in a little horse racing uh, wagering on Sunday, even Shocker. though it was a beautiful day, and most people would say great day to be at the beach, but... Uh, I managed to go out there and lose the money uh, back that I had won on uh, Friday. Uh, but yet, uh, out of the corner and one of the screens is a Dolphin game, and, and people are flipping out, man, saying, can you believe this? They were down 14 to nothing to Detroit. Now, we know it's Detroit, and, and Detroit have been getting clobbered in their last couple of ball games after being very competitive. Uh, you're wondering how much longer they go with Dan Campbell. Uh, they did make a move, I believe, yesterday that was kind of tantamount to a baseball team firing the batting coach, the hitting coach, when, when uh, you know, something goes wrong. They fired the defensive backs coach. And um, you know what? I, I don't know that the coach would have had much argument after that game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, right. uh, what, what were you thinking when they were down 14 zip? I mean, uh, what, where was, uh, you know, where was your mindset at at the time? I, I was in the mindset of, man, please don't let them lose on the road to Detroit because this is a team that couldn't shoot straight the last couple of weeks. But their offense, uh, the first four weeks of the season, was actually pretty good. And yes. Jared Goff was Over players good. rejoicing. And, and, yes. Yeah. And, and Detroit gets out to the 14 to nothing lead, and then they go up 21-7 at some point as well. Yep. But you had the feeling Miami – offensively wasn't going to be stopped. This was going to be a high scoring game and Miami was going to keep scoring. They just had to find a way to get off the field on defense. And they finally did that in the second half. You know, Detroit was, was pretty good in the first half on third down. I think they were four of six in the second half. They were over, you know, they threw a donut on third down and that really turned the game around. And Miami kept pouring it on, on offense. And Tua Tunga Bailoa was spectacular in that game. I mean, anytime you have Tyree Kill and Jalen Waddell uh, combining for 20 catches and, and almost, you know, 300 yards, uh, you're going to win games. You're going to be in games, and you're going to outscore 90% of the NFL. And they were able to do that. Uh, I just thought that, you know, this is one of those things that Miami's going to have to – Miami's going to have to 
get out of their own way in terms of penalties because that's oh been creeping God. in a little bit. It was 12 in the first um, half. You know, they won't, <laughs> yeah, they had seven penalties, but they had about nine of them that were declined. declined. Yeah, no, there was like 15 penalties. So, you know, against the Buffalo or against, you know, somebody like San Francisco or the Chargers down the road, that doesn't get it done. But if you can do it against Detroit and Chicago next week and overcome it because you're so good on offense, okay, you use those as learning, uh, learning you know, tapes and, and go back and, and Monday and Tuesday you have off and you come back on Wednesday and you go, okay, we can't do that again. But I, I thought this was probably one of the better games that Mike McDaniel called as a coordinator and head coach for Tua. They moved the pocket well. They did a lot of things that they, they do every week in terms of motion, but they got matchups that they liked, and they really wore out Hill and Waddle and found Kasiki in the red zone, which has been a, a, a nice find for this team. You know, he, he's not a blocking tight end as much as they want to try to convert him. He's not going to do it, so don't ask him to do it. Put him in a two-point stance and let him get open inside the 20, and you're going to win most battles. So, um they, they found a way to, to mix in a little bit of run with a, a lot of you know, explosive passing, and Hill and Waddle just can't be covered as the candle. Well, John, and was, you talked about it early in the year. You said the defense will have to carry them because the offense should get there, but it might take time with a whole new offense, with a lot of new parts. And we actually saw early in the season them starting to heat up, and then Tua got hurt. So last week was sort of the Tua getting back, and yesterday it looked like that offense that we had seen um, early in the year, and I get it, Detroit's defense is not good, but still, you know, like, it was nice to see them look like that. The Steelers' defense had been up and down, and they struggled last week, so it was nice to see them look good. The problem is, what the hell's going on with the defense? And I get it, no Byron Jones, and I get it, the secondary's hurt. But the defensive line isn't. The defensive line, you, you re-sign Agba. Phillips has a great rookie year. Ingram, you bring in. They don't get pressure at all, and in the, the second half, they sort of started to wake up, but, I, like, Jared Goff is immobile. Their offensive line's pathetic. And he was standing back there all day. And I'm just losing it. Like, what's going on, guys? Like, where's Phillips? Where's Ingram? Where Agba? Like, I, and this has sort of been a pattern. Like, they've struggled to get pressure on quarterbacks this season. Yeah, you, you know, I was thinking the same thing. And, and I feel like Josh Boyer, the defensive coordinator, I don't know if he's uh, – he's probably afraid – to send, yeah, uh, you know, an extra linebacker, Jerome Baker, or send Javon Holland again because Brandon Jones is out yeah, and yeah. Xavier Howard isn't a hundred percent, and you've got Noah Igbenogany. Whether you're going to flip a coin to say is he going to have a good day today or a bad day today, <laughs> um, you know, uh, you know, you have Bethel in the back there. You've got Campbell back there. You got a, a bunch of guys that you didn't plan on having uh, in the secondary, and now they've played a lot of football, so they should be ready to to kind of, you know, pin their ears back and go up with the front seven and, and put guys in man coverage and be okay. But I think you, you walk a fine line going, okay, we really want to – let's not make it easy for them and give them the easy chunk yardage play. Let's make them earn it a little bit more because our offense is going to outscore them. We just want to be able to stay on the field, stay on the field, and, and be able to bend and not break. And eventually they were able to be good enough up front because – Zach Sealer got his hands on the football a couple times. He got a, the only sack of the game. Somebody had to come through, and that was, you know, big 92 up front. Yep. But you're right. Jalen Phillips, and and you're, you're hoping that somebody's going to able, be able to put pressure on the in the pocket. Melvin Ingram, Van Ginkle, you know, Ogba. It just hasn't come with a lot of consistency, and you're hoping that that changes over the Chicago – Texans, Cleveland, bye week scenario that when they get hit the road uh, out in California and you have San Francisco, the Chargers, and Buffalo, you know, three weeks straight, that's going to be the season for the Dolphins. Yep. If they can do what they're, take care of business over the next, uh, I don't know, three weeks to month and then get ready for that, that stretch at the end. Certainly accomplished something that we've been looking for for years, and that is uh, no matter what, at least try to be exciting. Exciting. Uh, you know, the best part of uh, the season, I think, is that the uh, Dolphins' attempt at criminal activity failed. 
because they would look <laughs> yes. entirely different if they had a downtrodden uh, and now divorced Tom Brady <laughs> and uh, maybe soon to be a detached uh, Tom Brady uh, with the losing ways of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers <laughs> and Sean Payton uh, as their head coach. Because uh, uh, you do have to say, I mean, in, in assessing McDaniel and as critical as we were about uh, what seemed like a real bonehead coaching decision not to go for the field goal in, in the ball game and opting to go for a fourth and two uh, at the 14-yard line in the third quarter instead nearly cost them a game against a Pittsburgh team that's kind of staggering uh, offensively. So uh, should should be, you know, uh, uh, one that you could count on getting a win in, uh, and, and they barely did. I mean, they, they had to survive, uh, unfortunately, your man Kenny Pickett, uh, which uh, it, it, was his name changed? Was it re- originally <laughs> like Kenny Stewart, and they just put the pick in there? Because, wow, he is no, struggling I, I with those he... uh, throws in the pros. Yeah. Yeah, I I, but, uh, I think, you know what, go ahead. I, I think he's going to end up being a pretty good quarterback um, in terms of being able to throw it downfield and and being mobile enough. And I think he's going to be okay. Uh, we were yeah. very fortunate in that game that um, the Pittsburgh Steelers defense had you know Roberto Duran hand yep. and, yes. and really oh, dropped man. you know yeah. three or four the other way. So uh, you know. I think that uh, we snuck out of there. We got what we deserved. We were a better team than the Steelers, but yeah. we were very fortunate to, to come out with a, a W in that game. Well, and, and then, uh, you know, you're looking at some of the other games, uh, and that was uh, to his first game back, and, and he, he wasn't particularly sharp. Uh, in this game, he was razor sharp for the most part, but uh, you do have to like the way, and, and we haven't had this uh, here, this feeling here since Clayton and Duper for sure, uh, it's hard to get a tandem of wide receivers that are as exciting as Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddle. And, and had the original plan worked out, where we would be watching, watching, you know, a, a, I mean, a, you know, a grinding to a halt Tom Brady, uh, you know, uh, seeing his career possibly end on, on you know, uh, almost a Joe Namath type of note, where he's sitting on a Rams helmet there, a yep. broken man, yep. uh, and uh, and Sean Payton and and McDaniel has really done a good job of of opening things up and making use of these two guys. I mean, it's dynamic. And and I have to say, I love the uh, Waddle celebration with the Waddle because it looks like me coming down a short flight of stairs <laughs> here in the townhouse. <laughs> John, I hope this doesn't happen to you where you start to waddle uh, just, just when you're walking around. No, I, I it takes a while. I, I do that shuffle about 3.30 in the morning going to the bathroom. Yeah. I, I do the waddle every yeah, day. I'm with you. That, that's yeah. I mean, but... No, no. I mean, it's dynamic what they have it's going fine, on offense. And, and when it's clicking like that, uh, you know, and then you're looking at these wide open kind of run pass option plays for Tua. And, uh, you know, Tua, who was a little reluctant to take off last year uh, under Brian Flores, uh, is more than willing to just go head first into a dive <laughs> and, uh, you know, seems to be enjoying the fact that, uh, you know, the offense is more to, uh, you know, to his skill set than it was before when they were trying to make him something that he wasn't uh, a drop back passer. Tua is, is, in, is reaping the benefits of, of a well-schemed offense that has two of the most dynamic players in the National Football League running routes. And they don't even have to run the routes uh, perfectly to, to get this space that uh, no other team has the luxury, no other pass offense in the NFL has the luxury of, of, of catching passes with so much room. And people are always asking, you know, can the Dolphins – can, can these two receivers get better? And I say yes. How many times have you seen Tyreek Hill or Jalen Waddle catch a ball in stride and, and get yards after catch? Not much. They're catching it where they're – I mean, if you if you remember – if you can just go back and, and look at games, there's so much space where they're catching the ball. And I'm not yeah. so sure if they're running the correct you know routes at the correct depth and the right steps and the, doing the right thing because if they catch it on the run – they're going to get 40 or 50 more yards a game. They're catching the ball and falling down. Waddle's catching the ball. He's wide open. There's no one around him. He's jumping in the air and just falling down 22 yards down the field. You know, if Tyreek Hill doesn't have to stop every go route and Tua just throws yeah. one out there, he's going to have an 80-yard touchdown instead of a 45-yard completion. So there's more in this offense, and there's more plays to be made. But the plays they're making now – with the room that they create because of their space and the fear and the scheme that's involved in these, in this, in this offense, there's not, there's not one team in the national football league. I guarantee you that has the room 
between the linebackers and the safeties in the middle of the field than, than the Miami Dolphins have. Remember when you were playing in the Sandlot, John, and you would see the guy that was going to back off uh, the wide receiver that was uh, flushed out there to the right, and uh, yeah. he was going to give him like a 15-yard cushion, and his first five steps were backwards anyway. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I mean, that, that's what it's not like Mike Haynes and Lester Hayes are out there lining up against Hill and Waddle. I mean, I, I'm watching Detroit. They're, they're they're 10 yards off the line of scrimmage and they're backing up. They're backpedaling right away. So, I mean, there is a lot there. And, and, and Tua happens to excel at throwing that underneath, uh, you know, kind of mid range ball. So uh, and he's getting it out and, and releasing it quickly when he does drop back to pass. So uh, a lot of good things. I mean, you know, we, we were talking about yeah, coaching with, with Mario Cristobal and how the team should look better. But, I mean, uh, McDaniel really has done a great job of uh, kind of releasing Tua from uh, the shackles that he experienced there, which, which I think also led to more of his mental mistakes. You know, when, when you're, you know, playing uh, out of your element there and you're trying to make you something that you're not. And uh, and, and Waddle McDaniel, and Tyreek Hill, I mean, they couldn't be any better. It's great. Yeah, the, the good thing that McDaniel also is doing, guys, is he's masking the offensive line really well. The ball's coming yeah. out quickly. They're, they're able to run it. I mean, they're probably running three or four running plays, but they're doing it out of different motions. They're doing it out of different looks. And I, I think Moster is, is utilizing that top line speed that he has. I mean, remember, you've got three track guys, basically, in, in football uniforms that are, that are better football players than maybe they were track guys, and they were terrific on the track. Moster gets to top speed right away, so he's masking, you know, little creases that are, uh, up front and with the play action and the ball coming out quickly, I, I think that McDaniel is doing a nice job of putting Tua in a, in an area where he's going to excel, you know, 10 out of 10. So, you know, now you lose Eichenberg up front. So Jones is probably going to slot in at left guard. You've still got shell who, you know, we haven't mentioned him at right tackles and that's a good thing because he's playing seamlessly for Jackson. So he looks like art shell. Only, man. He really does. Yeah. Right. So the only the only roadblock that's coming are the Boza brothers, you know, in back to back weeks. Um, you know, they can start to feast on on a line that might be, you know, not as as strong uh, as, as some of the offensive lines that that you probably would have had for the Miami Dolphins. I think Armstead holding up. I mean, he's not practicing. Don't practice the rest of the year. Who cares? As long as he plays on Sunday, the Dolphins are going to take that, and he's healthy. So you know, Good. that's the only. That's the only area of concern. You know, if Armstead were to falter and with a toe injury, now you're really looking at three positions that you have to, you know, cross your fingers at because you're hoping to get Austin Jackson back at one of them within the next, you know, week to 10 days. Well, I'm sure Diva wants to move to the rest of the NFL. We'd love to cover it all with you, but I just want to ask one more thing because yeah. the Dolphins, and you, it's funny, you, and that's why we respect you and love having you on because you're very honest about the Dolphins, and you sort of lamented, much like me, the fact that they won't draft a freaking running back outside of the sixth round. Like, I, they have these guys, and it's improved in most certain Edmonds, but Edmonds have been sort of disappointing, um, and after that, it's nothing. And they're supposedly in talks with the Browns for Kareem Hunt and possibly an offensive lineman, which a few years ago I would have been happy. After his off-the-field stuff and his on-the-field play, I don't know what to think about with Hunt. The guy that was traded yesterday is the guy I wish the Dolphins would have gone after. Roquan Smith is literally the definitive thing the Dolphins need, playmaking linebacker. What are your thoughts on the idea that Dolphins are actually buyers at the trade deadline, which I don't think they've ever been in the last 20 years, and some of the guys that they're sort of being talked about flirting with? You know, it makes sense for the Dolphins to package somewhere in there an offensive lineman. Yes, please. I don't know if they'll do it or not. Um, They probably need to but it has to be beneficial uh not not just in the short term but in the long term because this is a team right now that i i think they can score at will and i i think they're worried you know if armstead's going to be able to hold up right they've gotten them through okay to almost to the midpoint of the season right now yeah. and he's hasn't missed a whole lot of time which is good. I think they did a nice job of planning ahead to say, you know what, we're not going to practice him. We're just going to play him. And he's going to have to be the pro that he is and, and be able to get work in on the side without really taking all those reps. And I think it's worked out for not only him, but the football team. 
Are they buyers? Yeah, I think they are buyers. There has to be the right. I don't think they're desperate buyers. You know, at five and three, they've got a good chemistry with the guys they have right now. They know their deficiencies, and one of them is probably, you know, up front on the offensive line. And probably plan B is to have a guy they have confidence in in the backfield. Uh, they, they like Mostert. They like Edmonds. Uh, after that, Ahmed and, and Miles Gaskin, they trade off and on, being, you know, being up or down on the roster. So I don't, I don't know if they're going to do pull the trigger in terms of being able to make a play there. I mean, it sounds great if they could do that with, with the Browns. But I, I don't know. I don't know if they do it if, if they feel like they're losing out and giving up too much in the deal. John Kajemi with us here. Uh, Pigskin Playbook, Dateline Dolphins, uh, brought to you by Jimmy Johnson's Big Chill, mile marker 104, the Overseas Highway in uh, Key Largo. John Kajemi with us here on, uh, well, with Pigskin Playbook, uh, also known as Dateline Dolphins. We'll get into the pros uh, as well. But, uh, you know, and, and this is always interesting for me because, uh, I mean, it, it was such a spirited thing uh, when uh, the Canes would take on Florida State for many years that I was doing broadcasting here on the local stations, uh, usually on a station that was uh, the flagship for Hurricane football, uh, originally IOD, then, then WQAM. And, uh, you know, so it, it, there, there was a, just a heavy concentration of interest in, in these games, and, and they were classics. I mean, uh, you know, there, there's so many moments that you can remember in flashbacks. But uh, not, not feeling anything uh, about, you know, this Florida State-UM game, except that it's a chance for Florida State maybe to distinguish – uh, Mike Norvell, uh, you know, being uh, well ahead uh, of where the Hurricanes are after originally, I mean, being so badly disparaged because he got off to such a slow start and, and it looked like Florida State was going backwards uh, instead of forwards. Mario Cristobal, on the other hand, I mean, I- I'm thinking this, John. I- I'm sorry. Uh, you know, all of these Mario apologists, I-, I like Mario Cristobal just like everybody else. I- I'm rooting for him to succeed. I'm tired of seeing, uh, you know, the same storyline uh, being applied to the Hurricane football team that I had a great affection for and affinity for uh, when I was covering the team for many, many years uh, on a much more, you know, uh, a close uh, inside basis. And um, yet all that being said, I mean, shouldn't they be better by supposedly Manny Diaz was a first time head coach? Uh, you know, I mean, still was a big question whether or not he was going to be able to handle a program, uh, you know, that that was. Uh, sort of downtrodden for a long period of time by their standards and, and then was trying to resurrect their way back to the top. Didn't do it. But you would think just by the fact that he's a better coach and has a better staff that this team would be performing at, at a better rate. What was that? And I'm going to use a, a little uh, Jewish slang here. Was that the worst piece of dreck you've ever witnessed a, as a football game in your many years of being involved in a sport and watching a sport? I mean, most people were saying, that was the ugliest football game and the worst example of football they've ever seen, Miami and Virginia. Well, uh, God bless myself because I didn't I didn't witness it. I didn't see it. <laughs> I just looked at it on my phone. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it was one of those I, 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 I don't have to regurgitate in terms of, uh, you know, watching that thing and talking about it. But as I'm as I'm looking at my phone and going, what, three, 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 nothing or three, three. Yeah. And then six three, and, and then the Canes seemed like they were in the red zone there forever. Uh, I don't know if it was my connection or, or my phone was just yeah. going on the fritz, but it just seemed like it sat there forever. And finally, you know, six six came up, and I, I was kind of you know get a sigh of relief, going, "Wow, the Canes were going to blow this one too." And they find a way to to win in I don't know what was it four overtimes maybe. Uh, um, yeah, I, I I I just don't know. I don't have any more. Uh, bad adjectives to describe um, what fans are feeling. You know, they they can't. They they just don't look cohesive now. And, and that's at some point that's got to be a reflection on the head coach, okay? Because for all the hype that Miami had going into the year, uh, you would think that yeah, okay, Virginia on a down year, Duke in a mediocre year, and they they had every right to lose both of those games. And and now you're going to flash the U up at me and tell me that's, that's your team? Okay, <laughs> great. You know, that's good, good yeah. for you guys, you know. But, uh, yeah, the numbers just don't bear out a, a mediocre team. I, I don't know if they're in the top 30 in any category, or 40 for that matter, uh, especially on defense. On defense, they may not be in the top 100 
in, in certain areas. You know, in total yards and passing yards and rushing yards and, and giving up points, uh, they're all, you know, 100 or worse in, in, in the country. Uh, that's terrible. And, and, and they're lucky. I think they're lucky to be 4-4, four and four, to be quite honest with you. Now, for Florida oh, no State, doubt. I think this is, this is a more important game for Florida State than it is Miami. And, and I say that because where's, you know, neither team are going anywhere, but at least Cristobal is in his first year, and he, he's going to get rope. You know, he's going to get two or three years because they're paying him and his coaching staff so much money, you can't cut bait that quick. But for Florida State now, they've got to show that, okay, even in a, in a bad rivalry matchup in terms of records, and in terms of team, you have to be the, the bigger brother in the state of Florida. You have to be able to beat Miami in a down year when you think you've got a pretty good football team. So it'll be imp- more important, I think, for Florida State to win this game than it would be for Miami, and that's saying a lot. Well, and, and John, uh, to stay with Miami for a second, um, I understand it's your one, and I understand he's got to – especially with offensive linemen, receivers. you got to bring his guys in. But the running back stable is supposed to be one of the best in the country. I mean, they I, – I can't even hate as an FSU fan. They literally have like six four-stars in that running back room. And Florida State does not. Yeah, Florida State's running back room looks like one of the best in the country, and UM's doesn't. To me, that's supposed to be his calling card is running the ball. They can't run the ball. Tyler Van Dyke came into the season. Defoe was, wasn't a joke. People listened to him when he was talking about Van Dyke being like 8-1 to one or – Twenty to one. He was forty to one to win the Heisman. Forty to one as a Heisman, but people look like a good play. Yeah, you know, as a thing, he's now benched, and then Garcia, who was a top five quarterback coming out of high school, going to UM, uh, is a total disaster. And and these are things Cristobal had issues with at Oregon. Like offensively, he struggled. He now goes to UM with all this speed and some talent, and they're struggling. To me, I get it's your one, but like some of it is sort of just track record. (laughs) Like, and when does that magically just change? I don't know. I, I don't think anybody knows at this point. Can you be can you imagine the excitement Miami fans, uh, you know, getting one of their own to come back and coach this team, and all of a sudden, you know, the, all the sports writers and, and the TV, you know, analysts and, and all the guys around the country picking Miami not only to win the Coastal, they're going to win the ACC, and they're going to be they have, have a, an outside chance at, at, at a football playoff this year because of their quarterback and the new head coach and, and all the recruiting success they've had and the pipelines getting uh, built up again because everybody wants to be part of the U. Gosh, and they just – and they're still getting kids. they got to get some Lakeland uh, to commit – I think it was last week we might have talked about it. Um, you know, a DB coming in. So, so th- that's going to continue to happen. Now, at, at some point you say, okay, we've got everybody we want. And we've got the coach we want. We've got the assistants we want. What we're, what's missing? You know, what what where are we falling short? The facilities have been upgraded. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure you know the alumni are still involved and they're coming back. And you know, you've got you've got Ed Reed involved in terms of um, you know being on on a daily basis in the building and, and motivating kids and telling them what how how it needs to to be at practice so they can do it on game day. Um, you've got everything in place, and can't can't beat Virginia or, or barely beat Virginia. And can't beat Duke at home. Man, that's that's got to leave a bitter taste uh, in your mouth. And I don't know if it changes. I really don't. I thought it was going to be one of those midseason uh, turnarounds for Miami, where they they have Duke and Virginia. That you start building up some confidence. You win a a rivalry type game. Uh, you get back over 500, and then you roll the rest of the way. Maybe it happens. I, I don't know. I, I don't see it happening. Uh, with with you know, as you as you get the feeling from UM that they're going to just stay kind of where they're at this year. Well, and, and you would also expect and anticipate that even though it's year number one, that you would see some kind of progression in the way the team performs. And uh, they've been so erratic. I mean. You were kind enough, uh, John, not to mention those hillbillies from Murfreesboro uh, coming in here and beating the Hurricanes at Hard Rock Stadium, Middle Tennessee State, which subsequently uh, to that win, uh, you know, they got themselves pummeled. I mean, just absolutely uh, swatted like the clubbing of seals in, in, in their next couple of ball games. So, 
It wasn't like they were some Appalachian state, uh, you know, that, that was uh, just underestimated because of the name of the school and uh, that, you know, you, you had hyphens in there. Uh, no, I, I would have expected to see more. I, I, I don't. Tony Segreto, you know, we all love him. He's painting this rosy picture, you know, and, and keeps going. It's year number one. I, I expected more in year number one. I, I really did. I, I expected to see some kind of tangible evidence that this was a better coaching staff. And as Luby mentioned, I mean, you have a, a Heisman Trophy candidate on the bench and, and uh, a guy that was some stud uh, that came in there and that, I mean, John, would you have run that ball? I, I don't know if you saw this play when they finally won a ball game on a two point conversion on the fourth overtime and uh, Garcia, uh, you know, runs the ball into the corner and barely gets in. He has two guys in front of him that he could have thrown a ball to. And you're screaming at the television set, throw the ball, throw the ball. <laughs> and you're thinking, wow, that, that was like one of the dumbest, I mean, maneuvers I've ever seen. I mean, it could have cost the team the game. And uh, I did not. It, I uh, didn't see that depot. I, like I said, I was, I was kind of uh, out of the loop, but I was, I was looking at yeah. my phone for updates, and I finally saw that they had won by two points. And it was, my dad was in total confusion because he's, he's, you know, eighty-one years old. He, he still has all his faculties, but he was, doesn't look a day over it, fifty. This cat. It, it, my, my dad's going. They they beat him with a safety in overtime. How did that happen? And I go, no, Dad, I think they just go for you know two point conversions. And he goes, Oh, that's no way to end the game. What the hell is that? You know, so it was, it was ended, great. It was it, it was great comedy, but I'm sure you know UM fans were were happy that they found a way to win in the end. John Kajemi with us, uh, although uh, not on a visual, he's on the road uh, doing legitimate work. And uh, your, your dad has a little Cab Calloway kind of look to him, you know, where you could see him tap yeah. dancing and singing, you know, with, with a straw hat and a cane. Man, he, he's got that kind of vibe. I mean, just a, a world-class uh, individual. All right, uh, more likely to happen, in your opinion, John Kajemi, just to wrap up this whole thing on the Canes, which, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm thinking here as we're speaking, well, I was spending like 15 minutes on this, and the team's become somewhat irrelevant. I mean, uh, in, in a short period of time, they, they went from, wow, I mean, the, the eye-popping catch of Mario Cristobal and we're bringing in Radakovich and uh, all, all of these stud coaches, uh, they're finally paying assistance. I mean, uh, poor Art Keo, right? He never saw money like this uh, with uh, all of his dedication. Right. And, uh, you know, it, it can only get better because Manny Diaz wasn't equipped to do it, whatever. I mean, it just didn't work out. And, uh, you know, let him go back to being a defensive coordinator and, and probably have success there, right? Isn't he at Penn State? Is yes. he Penn State? Yes. Yeah, he's yes. at Penn State. State. Yeah. Good football team. All right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's associated with, with uh, what, what's been a very, you know, uh, come back and become a, uh, a reasonably successful uh, program. But, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's kind of crazy to think that we're still at the same point and, and, and looking at this track. Uh, more likely to happen, uh, Vanilla Ice to have another number one hit or the Canes to win another national championship. <laughs> oh, God. Man, I'm, I'm thinking uh, there's yeah. no chance of Vanilla Ice coming back with a number one hit. Uh, I mean, I don't even know if he's in the music <laughs> business either. anymore. <laughs> But what do you think? You I mean, uh, I don't know. All, all roads, all roads lead to Miami, Miami then, Depot. If that, if, if that's the choice. Yeah. But I don't, yeah, think, by elimination. I don't think any anything like that is happening anytime soon. I, I really don't. And do you believe? I, I can't. Do you believe it. that? Uh, do you believe that FanDuel was responsible for the uh, rule change about overtime, so that uh, these games that got into overtime, I mean, even at six six, there was always the possibility that you might hit an over of fifty seven points. <laughs> if they got to overtime, <laughs> which uh, now there's no shot, man. I mean, I couldn't even cover the three points with the Hurricanes winning because it is Fugazi new rule here. Uh, Once again, thank you for tuning into the Default Show. It'll be here on the Five Reasons Sports Network. The Dolphins sitting at five and three. The offense is explosive. The defense showed some signs in the second half, but that defensive front is not getting the job done. We'll see if the Dolph what the Dolphins can put together this weekend against the Chicago Bears. Miami Hurricanes struggled, did not look good, but did get a win. They welcome the Florida State Seminoles, the 5-3 Florida State Seminoles, to town next weekend for a rivalry game that we'll see what it is. We'll talk a lot about that all week long. If you want to check out what we got going on in the mornings, the Diva Show with Luby live on South Florida Live. Just look it up, South Florida Live. Look up the Diva Show with Luby. Google, YouTube. Check us out there. You can also check us out, the Believe Network. Today, we talk with Billy Corbin, talking about South Florida. Billy Corbin, Mr. Cocaine Cowboys, has a new film coming out on Hulu. So we'll talk with him today. Check that out, the Believe Network, B-L-E-A-V.com. Search after hours. And most days, our South Florida content right here, 
Diva Show with Luby on the Five Reasons Sports Network. From the newly renovated sports bar to the beautiful bayside views captured at the Tiki Bar, Jimmy Johnson's Big Chill has it all. Located at mile marker 104, the Big Chill also offers waterfront dining while experiencing breathtaking sunset views of the Florida Keys. It's simply the hottest spot in the Keys to cool off. That's Jimmy Johnson's Big Chill at mile marker 104 in Key Largo. For more information, call today at 305 305- Four five three nine zero six six. These days, we're all looking for comfort anywhere we can find it. Thank goodness for Landlubbers Raw Bar and Grill in the Plantation because they are making sure you are as comfortable as possible. First of all, they're not only open for delivery and pickup. All you have to do is go to landlubbersbarandgrill.com for both pickup and free delivery. You're going to have the best wings in the world. You're going to have a great burger. You're going to have their amazing soups. Again, Landlubbers, Raw Bar, and Grill. It's nice and easy. Just go to landlubbersbarandgrill.com for both your pickup and free delivery. Thank goodness for Landlubbers for making you always feel right at home.